Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, such a pleasure to be to be here with you today, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and to your questions. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me. You know, if you have any question about uh, the the substance of of this, and and I look forward to your questions. Um, so the starting point of my remarks is that um, we uh, live in a world where you know the tax systems of, of today are to a large extent creations of the 1950s. Why is that the case? That's the case because um, if you look at the source of tax revenue in most countries, in France, in EU countries, and, and globally, what you see is that about half or more than half of tax revenues come from just two taxes. One, the VAT, value-added tax, you know, big tax on consumption that you pay when you go to the, you know, the grocery store and for any good and service that you purchase. And number two, payroll taxes, which are taxes on wages. You know, no matter typically how small the wage is, you have to pay quite a lot in payroll taxes. And the, the value-added tax was invented literally in the 1950s. It's a great uh, French uh, invention and a great French export, you know, like wine and cheese. It was first experimented in France in 1950s, and then it caught fire. And essentially, all the world's countries, with just a couple of exceptions, including the US, adopted a VAT uh, starting in the 1960s. Uh, payroll taxes are a bit older, but they were very small until World War II, and then they became quite big after the Second World War, when uh, governments needed money to fund you know, the new retirement system, social security that was created and developed after the Second World War. And um, the two characteristics of those taxes is that they are, they are flat taxes. You know, the VAT doesn't vary with your income. It de doesn't depend on how rich you are, just like payroll taxes. Um, and uh, they exempt saving. You know, there are taxes on consumption for the VAT and taxes on, on wage income for payroll taxes. Uh, so flat consumption taxes and taxes on, on payroll and wages, they made a lot of sense uh, in, in the post-World War II decades uh, and in the European context of the time for a number of reasons. Number one, it was just after the Second World War, and so capital was scarce. There had been destructions, uh, inflation, uh, the major you know, upheavals of the first half of the, of the 20th century, and so in 1950s, it made sense from a policy perspective to say, look, we want to encourage people to save, to, to rebuild the capital stock. And so, okay, it's not a problem. Perhaps even it's a good thing to have taxes that are going to be on consumption and that are going to exempt saving. Um, also, after World War II, uh, meaning the fraction of, of economic output of income that goes to workers as opposed to capital owners, the labor share was at a high, historically high level. You know, in, that was the time when unions were more powerful than today, where you know, labor had a stronger bargaining power than today. And so in that context, you know, of fast wage growth, of strong union power, it made sense to say, okay, to fund the modern social state, we are going to have payroll taxes on wage income and we're not going to tax capital income. And flat tax rates, meaning tax rates that doesn't vary with income or wealth, made some sense when inequality was at a relatively low level. And you have to think of those post-World War II years, 1950s, 1960s, as the low watermark for inequality of income and wealth in, in European uh, countries in, in, and in the US, okay? So all of that made a lot of sense, but the problem is that today's context is really the opposite of the context of the 1950s. So first of all, uh, capital is back, meaning there's much more capital today than uh, in the 1950s. The simplest way to, to quantify that is to look at the evolution of the ratio of, of wealth to GDP. So in the 1950s, this ratio of wealth to GDP was the equivalent of, uh, was around 200%, meaning the total wealth of a country like 
France or Germany or the UK or the US was the equivalent of two years of, of GDP, you know, two years of income. Wealth was the equivalent of two years of income. GDP is the annual income that, you know, uh, income flow, the annual value of all the goods and services produced in a given year. And so the annual value of all the income earned by residents of a given country in a given year. Wealth is the stock of, you know, real estate, so stocks and bonds and assets, financial and non-financial, net of debts that people own. So in 1950s, wealth was relatively small relative to income, and today wealth is much bigger relative to income. It's the equivalent of 600% of GDP. Second, the, the capital share of income uh, is rising, has been rising since the 1970s, 1980s. The labor share has been falling. And third, and perhaps most importantly, uh, inequality is on a rising trend. It's been a defining feature of the world economy since the 1980s. Uh, in most countries, inequality of income and wealth within countries has been on the rise, although not at the same pace everywhere, uh, particularly fast in countries like uh, India, China, uh, the US, uh, less fast in uh, uh, continental European countries, but pretty much everywhere there is this tendency towards more concentration of income and wealth. And so the point here is that we need to invent uh, new modern tax systems that are going to be adapted uh, adapted to the uh, challenges of today, you know, the return of capital, the rise of income and wealth inequality in particular. Now, the problem is when you say that, uh, the, the uh, immediate objection is that there is a widespread view that uh, uh, progressive and, and capital taxation are doomed uh, in a globalized world. Why? Because uh, Tax competition, according to this view, tax avoidance, tax evasion, mean that it has become impossible essentially to tax uh, uh, the wealthy, to tax mobile corporations, to tax high income earners. Because if you try to tax them, then they'll move to a low tax country, they'll shift their profits to tax havens. And you know, there's not much that we can do about that. So this is a pretty widespread view, and indeed, this is the main reason why um, many countries have cut their taxes on, on capital. Many countries used to have a wealth tax and have abolished their wealth taxes. Uh, it's also one of the main reasons why countries have started to tax capital income, the dividends, interest at lower rates than wage income. Uh, it's one of the main reasons why the corporate tax has been on, the, on a downward trend globally, you know, with the race to the bottom with corporate income tax rates. Uh, it all stems from uh, that view that, you know, taxing capital uh, and having progressive taxes in a globalized world just doesn't, you know, is not, is not, is not doable. Um, the problem with that view is that um, tax competition, tax avoidance, tax evasion, there are not things that exist like like stars in the sky. You know, they are not laws of nature. They are choices. Uh, choices that have been made, perhaps not very transparently and perhaps not very democratically, but choices that have been made nonetheless since the 1980s. Uh, we've chosen, you know, as nations, as groups of individuals, as citizens, we've chosen a certain form of globalization that's characterized by tax competition, by very little or essentially no tax cooperation or harmonization, by a great deal of uh, financial opacity, and other choices are possible, right? We could choose uh, coordination, we could choose to have common taxes, we could choose to have minimum taxes, we could choose to tax the profits that multinational companies book in, in tax havens, and so on and so on. The point being that, you know, the type of globalization that we've known since the 1980s is just one among many different possible forms of globalization. Um, and indeed, the, the proof that this is true is that there have already been some significant changes, significant evolution over the last few years. Now, the last decade has seen the emergence of new forms of international coordination. First, um, since 2017, 2018, there is an automatic exchange of bank information 
between banks that are located in, in tax havens, you know, in countries with traditionally a great deal of, of secrecy, you know, bank secrecy, like Switzerland, like the Cayman Islands, you know, places like that. For decades, financial institutions in those uh, countries didn't send any information about their customers to foreign countries' tax authorities. So in that context, it was really easy for people to hide assets and to evade taxes by moving assets into, into those countries. Um, that has changed since 2017 in the sense that now those uh, countries, financial institutions in those countries are required to, to automatically report each year on uh, the accounts of the, of the clients that they have. So for instance, if a French resident has uh, a bank account in Switzerland, in a Swiss bank, in principle, that Swiss bank today has to send that information to the French tax authority, has to report on how much, you know, euros or dollars or Swiss francs that person owns on any income earned by that person on her Swiss bank account, and so on and so on, making tax evasion much harder than in the past. And this is really an important development. You know, this automatic exchange of bank, of bank information is something that, you know, I remember when I started working on those issues, I started my, my uh, PhD in economics in 2009, and I, I was very much interested in those questions of offshore wealth, of trying to measure, you know, how much wealth is hidden in tax havens. And at the time, you know, it was, it was obvious to many economists and, and people in NGOs and activists that uh, 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 an obvious way to, to address at least partly this problem of offshore tax evasion would be to ask these, these banks to automatically send their information to the tax authorities, just like domestic banks do. So if you have an account with a French domestic bank, it's every year it's telling the French tax authority automatically. And so, you know, it was obvious already 10, 15 years ago or 20 years ago that the same should be done internationally. But at the time when you said that, you know, policymakers and, you know, experts said, well, no, that's, that's utopian. That's never going to happen because how could you force Switzerland or any other sovereign nation to change their laws. You know, if they want to have strict bank secrecy laws, that's their choice and there's absolutely nothing that can be done to make them change their mind. But in fact, we, we, we can see today that uh, uh, it was possible. You know, uh, what, how did it happen? Well, essentially, uh, the United States put, put pressure on, on, on Swiss banks you know, by threatening them with economic sanctions around 2010, 2011, and under the threat of those sanctions, you know, they agreed, these Swiss banks, to send information to the US tax authority, and then other countries like followed suit and said, okay, now if you cooperate with the US, why don't you also cooperate with us? Which just, you know, illustrates that, uh, uh, you know, new forms of international cooperation that, that were deemed, you know, utopian 15 years ago can in fact materialize in, in a very short period of time. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an important development. The second important development is uh, the real uh, prospect of an agreement on a 15% minimum tax for multinational corporations. You know, what is known as the OECD, what is known as the second pillar of the OECD two-pillar uh, solution. Um, this uh, agreement has been uh, you know, signed on to by more than 130 countries and territories, and implementation is uh, going to start uh, uh, as soon as next year in 2024 uh, in the European Union. So why is that important? It's important because it's the first time ever that there is an international treaty or international agreement that puts a floor to how low tax rates can go. You know, today, you know, before that agreement, there was absolutely no such treaty of this kind, you know, meaning any country, including within the EU, can choose any tax rate that it wishes. Any rate is consistent with all the international agreements that exist, even rates of 0% within the European Union are perfectly okay with respect to all European treaties and global treaties that regulate globalization. But now this is going to change. There's going to be a floor, a low floor, because 15% is not really high and not very high rate. But uh, you know, qualitatively, 
it's it's a change. Uh, it's it's a kind of a, a philosophical change now to say it's not okay for countries to choose rates that are tax rates on, on corporations that are really too low. You know, there has to be some floor. So what I want to talk about today is, okay, what should we think of these policies? You know, are they up to the challenges? And, and if not, what else is, is needed? And basically I've started by saying that these are you know, important policies and real improvements. But my, my argument is that you know, they're far from enough and much more needs to be done if we want to, to you know, transition towards these modern tax systems that we need, if we want to be able to be up to the challenges of rising inequality of income and wealth. And so uh, that's what I want to, uh, that's what I want to explain today. All right, let me start with uh, profit shifting and the limits of the OECD uh, agreement, the two pillar solution. And the starting point is that today there's about 40% of multinational profits that are uh, shifted every year to tax havens. So what does that mean? Multinational profits, these are the profits that are made by uh, multinational companies outside of the country of their headquarter. So think of the profits of Apple outside of the US or the profits of BMW outside of Germany. Globally today, 40% of this sum of, of, of profit is booked in places like uh, Ireland, like, you know, Caribbean tax havens and so on and so on. In 2019, you know, Alphabet, one of the biggest companies on the planet, uh, made about 20 billion euros in uh, profit in Bermuda where uh, the tax rate is a relatively modest tax rate of 0% and where they employ a relatively modest workforce of uh, three employees. But they you know, managed to book, to record $20 billion or so of profits in, in Bermuda. And that's just an example among many other examples. And when you add up all of that, you have you know, this number of 40% today, which means you know, that, that which is equivalent to about 1 trillion euros, about 1 trillion euros uh, these days, each year are booked by multinational firms in tax havens like Bermuda, okay? Um, if you want to have up-to-date numbers about all of that, the, the main source is, is this website and this research that I conducted with my co-authors, Ludwig Vier and Thomas Torsloff, Missing Profits of Nations, and the website is missingprofits.world, where you can see estimates for each country of how much profits are lost because of this shifting of profits, where the money goes, you know, how much is shifted out of a country like, I don't know, uh, Brazil to the Cayman Islands or to Luxembourg or to Bermuda, and what are the implied losses of corporate tax revenues for, for each country, okay? Um, how do we know that, you know, how can we uh, estimate those numbers is simply by, uh, using data that has become available recently that um, make it possible for each country to look at the profitability of local firms versus foreign firms. Foreign firms are firms that are uh, subsidiaries of foreign multinational companies. So foreign firms in Ireland are subsidiaries of US multinationals or French multinationals operating in Ireland. And local firms in Ireland are all other you know, domestic Irish firms. And for these two types of firms, you can compute a very simple uh, uh, profitability metric, which is just the ratio of profits, reported profits to wages paid. Okay, so in local Irish firms, in normal Irish firms, not part of a foreign multinational group, for any uh, euro of uh, wage paid, these local Irish firms record something like 80 cents or 50 cents in profits. And the same is true pretty much everywhere. That's the black line here. You know, pretty much in all countries for any euro of profits, uh, for any euro of wage paid, you have on average, you know, sometimes it's 30 cents, sometimes it's 50 cents, sometimes it's 70 cents in, in, in profits that are booked. But if you look now at, at foreign firms in tax havens, you know, the ratio of profits to wages is really super, super high. You know, in Ireland, it's about eight, meaning for these foreign firms, for any euro of wage they pay to Irish employees, the firms report, they declare making eight euros in profit. 
in Puerto Rico, you know, for any dollar of wage paid, uh, firms in Puerto Rico, which are essentially affiliates of US multinational companies, you know, Puerto Rico is separate from the US for tax purposes. They report uh, almost $17 of profit. Okay, so and you see in tax havens, there is this mismatch. There is this huge difference between the pink bar, which is the, the profitability of foreign firms, and the black bar, which is the profitability of local firms. Something that you don't observe, you know, in, in high tax countries. And so that's how, you know, by exploiting this differential profitability, that's how we can estimate, you know, how much profits are shifted to each of the world's uh, tax havens. And you can see that the countries where the, the, the uh, profits to wage ratio for foreign firms is the highest, which is on the y-axis here, the y-axis here is just the, the, the pink bar of that graph. Uh, in the countries where the profit to wage ratio is the highest for foreign firms, these countries are those where tax rates are the lowest. Okay, and surprisingly, these are the tax havens. You know, and the dots, are, are, uh, the size of the dots of the bubbles uh, is proportional to the size of the profits that are booked in those places. Okay, so you see the tax havens here on the, in the left top quadrant. You know, these are uh, territories and countries where tax rates are super low and the ratio of profits to wages for foreign firms is super high, okay? Um, uh, all right. Um, so one interesting question is, um, there's been, how, how to say that? For, for a very long time, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, nobody cared about these things. Uh, it's a bit of an overstatement, but profit shifting, you know, the way that multinational tax companies use tax havens didn't attract a lot of attention from policymakers. It, it, it was really not top of the agenda. Part of the reason is that the rise of multinational companies is a relatively recent phenomenon that has really accelerated since the start of the 21st century. Um, but what has happened is that recently there's been a lot of interest, okay? There's been this OECD uh, agreement that I, uh, that I mentioned. Before that, there had been earlier attempts uh, to harmonize you know, tax rules also under the auspices of the OECD. Um, uh, there has been a number of tax reforms uh, that have uh, attempted to, uh, to uh, address this uh, issue of profit shifting. In the tax reform that was enacted in the US at the end of 2017, there's a number of provisions that are supposed to make it harder for US multinational companies to shift profits to tax havens. But so what, we can ask, okay, has, have things changed you know, since this uh, tax reform that, that entered into force in 2018? And if we look at the case of US companies, we can see that doesn't seem to be the case that a lot has changed since then. You know, the fraction of total profits here, it's both multinational and domestic profits, but the fraction of the total profits of US companies that are booked in tax havens, you know, has been on a rising trend since 1980s. And, you know, perhaps it has declined a tiny bit since 2018, but it's really, you know, it's very quite small compared to the huge increase that has happened um, over, over years. And so there's little sign that, little evidence that profit shifting is, is abating uh, post uh, Trump tax reform. Uh, meanwhile, the race, the race to the bottom with corporate income tax rates is uh, continuing and to some extent is accelerating. So this is just showing the evolution of the statutory corporate income tax rate. You know, we forget about that, but in the 1980s, the, uh, the average corporate income tax rate uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the European Union, for instance, was you know 45 percent, close to 50 percent. The US used to have a 50 percent corporate income tax rate. You know, in most countries and continents, you know, the corporate tax rate was either around 40 percent, 45, 50 percent. That used to be the norm, you know, only 40 years ago. And since then, there's been this dramatic race uh, to the bottom, which is you know continuing, accelerating to some extent after the US, you know, had this big tax cut. Uh, in in twenty in twenty eighteen, okay. So uh, let me talk a little bit about 
uh, whether this, this big international agreement, this two pillar solution is going to address the problem. And uh, the answer is no. And the reason is a tiny bit technical. It's something that very few people have actually understood, but I, I hope I can convey the reason, the fundamental flaw with that agreement uh, in simple terms and that everybody will, will understand the problem. It's a really deep uh, technical problem that reflects a, a, a philosophical problem. In the agreement, there is um, uh, a, a, an exemption for uh, profits uh, that are booked in places where firms have real activity. So let me unpack that. What the agreement at the high level says is that um, multinational companies should pay at least 15% on their profits in each country where they operate. Okay, but 15% of what? The question is 15% of what? And what the final agreement says is that firms can exclude from the base of profits to which this 15% rate is going to be applied, they can exclude normal quote unquote profits. Normal profits meaning profits that correspond to their, uh, to their normal activity. What it means is that if a firm operates in Ireland, for instance, and has uh, capital in Ireland, you know, factories and headquarters and so on, and buildings, and it pays people, it pays employees in Ireland, then this firm can, you know, exclude a certain amount of profit that's equal to 8% of the value of the capital stock plus 10% of the value of the wages, you know, paid by that firm to Irish employees. You take the sum of that, 8% of the capital stock, 10% of wages, and the, the sum of this is the amount of profit that you can exclude from the base of the minimum tax. That's the profit that will not be subject to the 15% minimum tax. These profits can remain essentially tax-free. Okay, so what this means, the, the, you know, philosophically, what this means is that what the agreement does is it says, okay, if a company books a lot of profits in uh, a country or, or a territory where there is no substance, there is no real economic activity that takes place, let's say Bermuda, profits in those territories now are going to be subject to a 15% minimum tax rate. That's real progress. So it will not be possible anymore for country for companies like Alphabet to you know uh, book a ton of, of profits tax free in places like Bermuda. So that's good. That's real progress. But now what the agreement says is that if you know companies book a lot of profits in Ireland or, or, in, or in Singapore or, or in Switzerland or in Netherlands and they move. Not, not only do they book their profits there, but they move their factories, they move their workers there, then they can still pay zero. They don't have to pay the minimum tax. And the, the implicit justification behind that type of agreement is that the artificial shifting of profits to tax havens is a bad thing. You know, It should not be possible to pay zero tax on profits booked in places where there is no substance, but According to that view, uh, real tax competition, meaning companies moving factories to places where taxes are low, moving workers to pl places where taxes are low, that's legitimate. And there should be no flaw whatsoever to that form of tax competition. So that's the philosophy that underlies this agreement. And in my view, it is a very destructive philosophy because it legitimizes you know, real tax competition, which to some extent is even more costly and dangerous than, than you know, the artificial shifting of profits to tax havens. Because what the types of incentives that this creates, you know, it creates incentives for firms to not only move their paper profits to, to low tax places, but also to move their real activity out of uh, France, out of Germany, and, you know, to, to low tax places. Okay, it legitimizes the view that no limits should be put to tax competition and that even rates of 0% are acceptable as long as there is actual economic activity in tax havens. So that's really the critical flaw that, you know, few, unfortunately, relatively few people have uh, understood. All right, so why, why, uh, 
are we in a situation where this type of agreement gets to be uh, signed? I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the political economy of that type of agreements. You know, how do countries decide to, to sign such treaties? And the starting point here is that it's very important to understand a very basic point, but you know, so it took me a very, it took me a long time to understand this, even though this is really very, very uh, basic and intuitive. The basic point is that uh, tax havens benefit a lot from a narrow, you know, monetary perspective. Even from a very narrow monetary perspective, tax havens benefit a lot from uh, choosing very low tax rates. It. it you know, it took me a lot of you know, it took me a lot of time. So, for instance, during the financial crisis, just after the financial crisis of 2008-2009, um, Ireland had big problems. You know, uh, huge uh, public debt, big deficits, and uh, the European Union. You know, the IMF, the Troika. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 entered into discussions with Ireland to kind of bail out Ireland. And at some point, you know, uh, some some people involved in these negotiations, you know, France, French representatives in particular, said to Ireland, "Look, we're not going to bail you out unless you increase your corporate income tax rate. You have, you know, public finance problems, but start by increasing a bit your your tax rate, you know, from the current level of 12.5 percent to a higher tax rate. So that's going to fix some of your, you know, problems." If you want, if you need more tax revenues, just increase your tax rate. And uh, the uh, the Irish uh, government uh, at the time replied, "No, no, no, we're not going to do that because if we do that, uh, it's going to backfire. We're actually going to lose tax revenues. It's going to make things worse. We have twelve point five percent. You think it's a very low tax rate." You're asking us to increase our tax rate, and we are telling you, no, no, that's going to be bad for us. That's going to just in terms of you know deficits and debts, it's going to increase. You know the deficit is going to reduce tax revenues. And at the time, you know, I thought, no, that's crazy. It cannot be right. It cannot be right that you have such a low tax rate, and starting from this low rate, if you increase it a little bit, in fact, it's going to to destroy tax revenue. I I don't buy that. But then I I learned better, and I you know what I learned is that. Actually, they were right. No, it's it's true. It is absolutely true that if you are very uh, no small or relatively small country in a world where there is no coordination, no minimum tax rate, where every country is free to choose its tax rate, the revenue maximizing tax rate is actually very low. I'm sure many of you you know are familiar with the the famous Laffer curve, right? So the Laffer curve is. You know, the famous curve where you know, on the x-axis you have the tax rate and on the y-axis you have tax revenues. And uh, okay, if, if, if the tax rate is 0%, tax revenues are zero, right? If the tax rate is 100%, tax revenues are also zero because nobody's going to work or produce anything if you know absolutely every income is taxed at 100%. And so if you studied a bit of mathematics, you know you immediately understand that there has to be uh, a maximum. There has to be a certain tax rate that maximizes tax revenues. That is known as the Laffer, the Laffer rate. That's the tax rate that maximizes tax revenue. Okay, and so, the reality, the reality of globalization today is that for a small country, the Laffer rate, the revenue maximizing tax rate for the corporate income tax is really super low, something like maybe, you know, five, five, ten percent. Meaning if you choose 15 percent, you're on the wrong side of the, of the Laffer curve. You, know, you can increase your tax revenues by cutting the tax rate. Just like Laffer said, you know, in the 1970s, except that in the Laffer, you know, worldview, the Laffer theory. So Laffer in the in the 70s was arguing that the U.S. was on, on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. That the U.S. could increase its tax revenues by cutting, you know, their tax rate. And and but the the rationale for that, the the, the theory was okay. If we cut tax rates, 
uh, people are going to work more, they're going to innovate more, more businesses are going to be uh, founded, and that's going to just make the pie bigger, okay, that's going to spur economic growth. That's what, that was the Laffer theory, but if you apply this Laffer curve thinking to international tax competition, the reason why the Laffer rate is so low today has nothing to do with that. You know, the reason why tax havens can collect so much tax revenue by choosing low tax rate is just zero sum, is because they can attract, by choosing low tax rates, they attract a ton of profits from other countries. And that's just zero sum. You know, one extra euro of profit booked in Ireland means one euro less booked in, you know, Brazil or, or France or China. Um, so, uh, so that's that's the key difference. Um, anyway, when you look at the data, you, you realize, you know, that that this this uh, this is true in the sense that the countries that collect the most uh, corporate income tax revenues relative to the size of their economy. Are, are, are notorious tax havens, you know, countries like Malta collects the equivalent of 8% of its national income in corporate income tax revenues, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Cyprus, you know, top the ranking of countries ranked by corporate income tax revenues relative to, to national income, and vice versa, at the, at, at the bottom of the ranking, you have high tax countries, you know, Italy, US, Germany, Spain, that have much higher tax rates, but collect much less tax revenues. So, you know, Laffer was right, but wrong, you know, in the sense that, yes, if there is no tax coordination, no harmonization, then the revenue maximizing rate for a small open economy is really low, but it's pure, it's, you know, it's pure theft, so to speak, you know, it's, it's zero, it's really zero sum. It does nothing for economic growth. Uh, just another illustration of that. So just to, you know, illustrate the fact that that the countries that choose very low tax rates derive you know real monetary benefits from from that strategy uh, if you look at the amount of corporate income tax revenue collected by you know here i show ireland france and germany amount of corporate income tax revenue per capita in 2021 so in ireland uh, total corporate income tax revenues per capita amount to about 3000 euros per year Okay, so think of this, you know, for, for a family of four, you know, two, two adults, two kids, that's 12,000 12, euros, you know, in corporate income tax revenues collected by Ireland. That's a lot of money, right? It's really quite a lot. Um, and um, it's essentially uh, corporate income tax revenues that are collected from not Irish companies, but from multinationals that operate in Ireland and, you know, Logic is very simple, is these multinationals, because tax rates are so low in Ireland, book a ton of profits in Ireland, so that even with a tiny tax rate applied to this huge tax base, that generates a lot of money for, you know, the, uh, the Irish treasury. Now, if you compare that to France, Germany, you know, they collect about 500 euros in corporate income tax revenue per capita. So the bottom line here is just a very simple idea, which is just that the, the a certain number of, of countries derive pretty big economic, even narrowly defined, you know, economic benefits from tax competition from, from the current status quo. And they have absolutely no interest in, uh, an, in an evolution towards higher rates, to, towards more cooperation and so on. And so once you un you've understood this, you've understood the, the kind of fatal flaw in, in, in the way that we try, you know, collectively at the international level to address those issues. The fatal flaw is to uh, uh, ask for unanimity. So within the European Union, nothing can be done in terms of taxation if there's not a unanimity of the 27 member states. But now globally, you know, the way that uh, organizations like the OECD negotiate international agreements is that they insist on uh, bringing on board essentially almost all the world's countries and territories. They have this objective of being, you know, uh, inclusive, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, uh, it's uh, how to put it, a, um, uh, 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 it's not, you know, it shouldn't be the goal in that context. It shouldn't be the goal because if you start, if your if your objective is uh, if if you insist on on the agreement of each and every country, you know, given that some countries derive so much benefit from the status quo, it's not going to work, and uh, you are going to end up in a situation where you have 
you know, these the types of loopholes that I was describing previously, exemptions and so on, that make the agreements uh, essentially toothless. All right, so let me talk a little bit about uh, 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 about how things could be uh, could be done uh, differently. So, um, a more fruitful, you know, way to address those issues, in my view, is to by following the the model of what happened with bank secrecy. You know, what have I, I I started by you know telling the story of the US, you know, under Obama in 2010, 2011, like threatening Swiss banks with economic sanctions if they refuse to cooperate. And then how this unilateral action paved the way eventually for, you know, a nearly global agreement on the automatic exchange of bank information. It seems to me that the same logic could apply with, with corporate income taxation, meaning any country, even any, you know, an individual country, could say, well, uh, we are going to collect the taxes that uh, tax havens today refuse to collect. So what does it mean? Today, you know, the fundamental problem that we have with uh, corporate taxation is that there is no uh, tax collector of last resort. You know, if, uh, if, if Google books profits in Bermuda and the tax rate is 0%, that's it. They don't have to pay taxes to any country. What we need is one country or a set of countries that would say, you know, look, if you've booked profits in Bermuda and Bermuda chooses to collect no tax, fine, but we are going to collect the taxes that Bermuda doesn't collect. And any country could choose to play this role of tax collector of last resort. So for instance, you could imagine a country saying, well, okay, if you make 10% of your global sales in, in our territory, then we are going to collect, you know, 10% of the taxes that you should pay, but that you're avoiding by booking all these profits to tax havens. And that's, that's doable. And, uh, you know, one country could do it, could collect a lot of tax revenue by doing that. And then you can imagine how other countries might be tempted to emulate that strategy. And if sufficiently many countries choose to join that, coalition, then essentially, you know, there would be no place to hide by uh, multinational companies, and it would become pointless for firms to book profits in tax havens. The uh, tax reductions that they would get by doing so would be offset by higher taxes paid in, in other countries, you know, where customers are located. And so it would become pointless for tax havens themselves to offer low tax rates. So you can see how, you know, in fact, you can quite quickly, I think, um, move from the current equilibrium of uh, very little international co coordination, you know, lots of profits in tax havens to uh, another form of, of uh, globalization where, uh, you know, uh, you would see tax havens increasing their tax rates and it would be very hard for companies to, uh, to dodge taxes as, as they do today. Okay, so I have many uh, other things to discuss, but I want to leave enough time for the discussion. Um, uh, let me um, just mention one last thing related to all of that, which is that um, the, the a big uh, major flaw of um, uh, the, the the current you know very limited regulation of of uh, tax issues at the global level that we have is is the outsized role played by international organizations that only represent the interest of high income countries, namely the OECD. So the OECD is really, you know, the international organization that uh, serves as uh, the the agent of uh, you know tries to push towards more coordination and tries to craft those those agreements that we discussed. The problem is that it's really a club. For rich countries, okay, there are, I think, 28 or something close to 30 members, only high income countries that represent, you know, 20% or less of the of the global population. It excludes, you know, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, you know, essentially uh, all the global South. And you know, it's it's not it's not possible to uh, uh, to find a just distribution of tax revenues 
by uh, ignoring 80% of the world population. And yet this is how this is, uh, this is done at the moment. So in the future, it's going to be critical to uh, see the emergence of new international organizations that take a truly global perspective and that take seriously the interests of developing countries. And developing countries, you know, many of them are, very, are quite angry at this two pillar agreement because, you know, they had very little say uh, in, in the final outcome of all of that. And I think, you know, uh, it's fair to say that this process gives more voice to, you know, countries like Ireland, more, they have more power, they have more say in the final outcome, countries like Ireland, like Hungary, uh, than uh, than India or than than Brazil, and and that's that's very difficult to to justify. All right, um, uh, I'm going to skip that, and I'm just going to conclude by saying that we need new instruments, uh, new forms of cooperation, and and new institutions to uh, to address the challenges of the of the 21st century. So beyond the automatic exchange of bank information. Uh, fundamentally, what we need is more uh, transparency about wealth. I, I'm sure you know that uh, essentially all countries have uh, real estate and land registries that record the ownership of land and real estate. Uh, these registries have existed for, for sometimes for centuries. You know, in France, the real estate registry was created by the French Revolution in, in the late 18th century. And at the time it was created, most of people's wealth was land or real estate. And so having a registry, a public registry at the time of the ownership of land and real estate means meant that most of people's wealth was publicly recorded. But then over time, you know, the nature of wealth has changed. And today things like stocks in companies or financial assets more broadly are much more important than land and real estate. And yet uh, we don't have financial registries. You know, our, our institutions have not kept up with changes in the nature of wealth. We could recreate much more transparency by you know, creating a, a na national financial asset registry that could become then regional, maybe at the EU level and then eventually global. Beyond the two pillar agreement, we need to take the interest of developing countries much more seriously. And finally, you know, the way to, to, to make some progress in those international tax issues is by you know, uh, escaping the straitjacket of unanimity. I made the case for unilateral and multilateral actions. This is you know, what can, of course, international cooperation, inter truly global agreements are, are desirable, but it shouldn't be the starting point, it should be the end the end point, you know, and the way to, to get to ambitious global agreements is to start with ambitious unilateral and multilateral action. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to count time? Can you go? Uh, Simran, it's blocking that. Uh, guys, it's fine. Yeah. 
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor, a lot for the presentation. So today we're gonna try to point out some missing points of your presentation uh, while I'll try to review the paper on the missing profits of nations and opening a, a, a big, uh, a little bit broader discussion, let's say. So first, uh, giving some context in terms of literature and contribution, of course, Professor Zuckman is um, humble, but uh, he is here today presenting to us a very important uh, literature that he's been working on more than a decade on world uh, wealth inequality, its long run tendencies and how the state so can act on it. So it's a public economic um, field uh, and tackling inequality. This was a, was a breakthrough research because it was the first to use an organized macroeconomic database to look at wealth stocks and not only uh, flows of GDP uh, and also because it brought back uh, one thing that the classical economists used to do, which is always look at the long run capitalist tendencies of distribution and accumulation. Maybe that's why they, they lack so much the parallels with the classicals, the, the hidden wealth foundations, the capital in the 21st century and so on. Uh, so the main idea that they are posing here is that capitalism has an inherent tendency uh, to increase inequality because the net return on property, uh, they are, historically is always greater than the growth rate of the economy. So if the, if the return on property is growing faster than the economy itself, so you're concentrating wealth, concentrating income uh, into the property owners, and then you're always gonna have this tendency to inequality, which was stopped um, exceptionally during the, the Great Depression and the wars because of the destruction of capital. And then you had a period of, of capital scarcity, but then in the eighties, uh, we got back to business as usual with the strengthening of the of of capital and the rise of capital power that the professor mentioned uh, which can be seen by the increasing profit shares so this literature had a big impact on mainstream of economics bringing back to the debate uh the inequality back to the central debate in economics yeah, in order to broaden the discussion we also use your, the the book you wrote recently at uh, the triumph of injustice and it's also a way to show and highlight the contribution, uh, your, your contribution for also the public debate uh, in terms of fiscalities. So in, in this book, you also bridge a gap in terms of data because the CBO, the, the authorities, fiscal, fiscal authorities in the US doesn't count at least one third of the tax in their accountability. So they, 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 they create the new database using um, uh, other data in order to bridge this gap which shows also the tax regressivity of uh, the, um, the tax in, in, in USA. And it also did democratize the fiscal debate because for instance, they developed this, um, this tool, which is called uh, Tax Justice Now, Now, which is a simulator in which you can basically create your, your own uh, pathway in terms of tax, see the, the, the consequences in terms of uh, wealth for different uh, class, uh, for different social class. And there's, for each article they write, there is an open source uh, database. You can check on the website. It's like, it's very well done. Well, as every literature of great impact, you always have a lot of critiques, of course. Um, so here we're not gonna talk about them all, but we're gonna point out some. Um, so some authors like McCloskey and Mankiw are gonna say inequality is not a problem in itself. I think we don't have to go through this in this uh, room. Uh, and then in terms of methodology, there's some contradictions in terms of how profit is measured um, and the data that is used. Galbraith and Harcourt discussed that a lot. Um, then you have the background of the theoretical growth theory. We're going to uh, come to that later in the discussion. But then there is one I think that the, the, the first works on this uh, literature have been criticized a lot, which was the universality of the results. So many of them will say, no, the, the, the rise of capital is actually something you can only see in the US uh, and can be related to, to technical um, changes and to the technological um, specificities of the country. Which brings us to, to this paper, the, the working paper that the professor presented. Um, and it's is co-authored with Thomas Torsley and uh, Ludwig Vier, uh, The Missing Profits of Nations. So they use the profit affiliated statistics on these new statistics to profit the the to map the profit shifting that we have just seen. Uh, and this methodology is I think very interesting because it allows uh, to quantify the loss of tax revenue of each country. And it, it can also be uh, updated every year and policymakers can track that. So this is an important paper in this literature exactly because it's gonna show that the capital rise is um, uh, 
uh, is global. It's not only in the US. It is a phenomenon of globaliza globalization, but it was obscured by the tax evasion that uh, we have just seen. Yeah, now we're going to present some things about the methodology. So first, let's again define the profit shifting. So as we said, profit shifting is a, is a technique used by multinational corporation in order to pay less taxes than they should. And there's three main ways uh, to, to, to do profit shifting. And it's very interesting because we all know that there is tax evasion and this kind of behaviors, but we somehow don't really know how do they do it. And it's not that easy that we can we can think. So there is three mains here in the article, but we, we, we can broaden uh, this discussion with these authors here. So first, there is intra-group export and import prices. So basically, uh, intra-group export and import, uh, export prices, the, uh, like subsidi subsidi subsidiarity in high uh, tax uh, countries can try to export goods um, uh, and services uh, for a very low price to the, to the, to the country in the low tax uh, countries countries and import at the, uh, on the contrary at a very at a very high uh, prices uh, which help to shift some 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 profits the second possibility is also to use intra group interest payment so affiliate in high tax country can borrow money uh, to the the affiliate in the low tax country with substantially high uh, uh, interest rate and lastly, it's to move intangible. So basically intangible are brand logos, uh, patents, algorithm, um, et cetera. And they're made in high tax, in uh, affiliates in high tax country. And they can move them into the low, low tax country in order to ask them uh, uh, earnings, for instance, uh, royalties or like ways to, to get back the money. Um, then I will explain very, very broadly uh, um, the, the methodology steps. steps. So basically, they, they, there's three main steps. First, they want to show, I'm going to do it. They want to show that foreign firms are hugely more profitable uh, than local firm in tax haven. Uh, for instance, in tax haven, uh, the ratio of pre-tax profit to wage is about uh, 30 40% for local firms, but it's an order of magnitude much more important, as we said in your presentation. The second step was to find the limits, the amount of profit shifting, uh, sh shifted into each tax haven. Uh, they explored the affiliate statistics to do that, and it, it, it enabled them to attribute the true economic differences uh, with the local firms. And lastly, uh, they reallocate um, the shifted profit to the countries uh, where it was uh, it had been made. And this is re highly irrelevant because as a policy maker, for instance, you can uh, somehow find how, how, how much money you, you, you are losing because you can, you can directly know how much profit you, you were supposed to tax. So to explain why this difference between the local firms and the foreign firms profit, why you can see these differences and why is it due to profit shifting? There are three main assumptions which are explained and analyzed into the paper. The first one is this via this idea that the cup de glass production function has a one-to-one -one elasticity of substitution. It means that the change of the capital um, intensity doesn't have an impact on the capital share. If it was not the case, for example, that this elasticity of substitution was a bit higher than one, it would have meant that the firms in uh, high capital items in the firms then have a higher shift, uh, like a profit shifting. And if it was on the contrary, then it would mean that it would have been a lower profit shift than what we can see in the reality. A second assumption is this one, that there is a same level of competition between foreign and local firms. It means that when it comes to the access of the resources or the access to the markets, into the tax events which are analyzed, there is the two firms are facing the two types of firms are facing the same kind of competition. The last assumption is this one: there is no in what profit shifting in local sector. Why this assumption is really important? Because the local firms are considered to be the baseline in order to consider how much is important this phenomenon of profit shifting. That's the reason why this assumption is so important. And actually, all these assumptions they are going they are, they are they are considered into the paper. They are analyzed, and they are seen how much how much these assumptions are respected. Are respected how much is going to change this phenomenon of profit shifting. But then we can already but we can criticize how relevant are these assumptions. Yeah, the paper didn't make it very easy uh, to criticize it <laughs> because itself uh, tested a lot empirically. 
Um, but we're gonna now show a little bit of investigation on, on some of these assumptions. So for example, of the from the for the Cobb Douglas, you test very different types of um, elasticity of substitution. But then we're gonna bring a, I think a discussion that is a bit uh, further, which is uh, the contradiction between using aggregate production function uh, with one homogeneous good while considering changing in income distribution. This dates back to the capital controversy. Um, between the two Cambridges, you're probably well aware. Uh, but basically for the ones that are not, it's it's understanding that because in the neoclassical model, uh, the rate of return on capital is at the same time important to give the price and then the total quantity of what you're producing. But at the same time, it is a measure of distribution. You cannot assume that you can aggregate different types of capital uh, if without changing income distribution. So when you have different types of capital, uh, income distribution is also going to change the aggregate production. Um, yeah, Strafa is the, one of the first that talked about this, and Philip and Macombi are more recent uh, work on that. Uh, and then also the background growth model, of course, is uh, Herod Domain solo model. Um, and then it was criticized in the beginning by Soskis, which is also a, a new Keynesian, saying that the model is pre Keynesian because uh, savings are determining investment and you don't have any role for business. So any type of uncertainty and, and actually the savers are determining investment. And also Rothal is gonna say that the new classical growth uh, model of solo predicts a stable or falling capital output ratios, which is the opposite of what the research is finding, which is uh, increasing capital to output ratio. And this comes us to question why uh, don't use growth models that uh, understand that inequality also have an effect on growth through demand, for example. Um, this of course comes from a long tradition from Cambridge and Kaleski, Robinson, and so on, but it also has been used by more um, new Canadian authors like me and Straub and Sufi from Harvard. So analyzing, analyzing the theoretical framework, so not about the results, but about, about like these assumptions, what uh, we can talk about it. The thing that the local firms and the foreign firms are the, considered to be the same coming to concurrence. Actually, what are these foreign firms? <clears throat> There are oligop uh, oligopolistic companies that manage to move from a country to another to move their, their profit, and these are like enormous transaction costs. It's uh, everything. So it's these transaction costs like like highlight how they are particular coming to the local firms, and these foreign firms they might have like a different path dependency from the local ones, a different trends of patents ownership, different economies of scale. And there might be like oligopolistic structures which are shifting their profits. And again, so like reading through the assumptions, like there is something about the link between the assumptions, the second assumption and the third one. This idea is that if local and foreign firms are facing the same competition, they might have then the same behavior coming to profit shifting. Then they might both practice like uh, they uh, like the local firms might also practice profit shifting. So it shows how it's hard building a theoretical model facing uh, all this, uh, like uh, considering uh, all these difficulties coming to behavior of the firm. And also, like for further research, when it comes to use this model, which is really valuable, there are other things that we found important to consider. For example, to integrate the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. The difference is fundamental since the first one is legal and the second one is illegal. So especially if you consider that you live that you are in a democracy and that the willingness of the people is highlighted in the law, then distinguishing these two elements seem really important. Another thing is considering the full range of taxations of the firm's behavior. In the model, what matters is that uh, the corporate tax it means that the companies are going to allocate their profit uh, according to the corporate tax. And actually there are other things which can impact the behavior of the firm, such as, for example, outsourcing. This thing of not having employees, uh, so then you don't have to pay, uh, uh, you, know, you don't have to pay the full wage, like the, the part of the wage we, that, the, that the state has. It is the way for the firm to optimize its profit on the same way. 
And then the fact that the impact of the size of the firm on the firm's behavior or something I already mentioned, the huge oligopolistic companies have possibilities which is not possible for CMEs since they have access to the best lawyers, they have enough, mo mo enough money to create these juridical, these low structures in order to optimize their profit. And another element, which is the diversity of tax havens, for example, in the European Union, it's uh, for Portugal as a really good policy when it comes to royalties. Luxembourg has a really good policy when it comes to um, finance, finance taxation. So kind of every country has its speciality when it comes to the legislation. And the last element I would like to mention is that this thing of tax evasion is a really complex topic. It's a crossover between economics, law studies. It's actually in law, it's a speciality, it's business law. And it's a, it's a really specific, uh, it's a education that I have. And of course, geopolitics. It's a matter of relationship between the states. It's a matter of fight between the states. And uh, so coming to this thing that fighting against tax evasion is a domestic political issue. Just to remind you quickly, like with the rise of globalization, as Sir Sugman explained to us, there is these structural causes of massing profit cheating. So the uh, free movements of capital, financialization, ITC revolution. And ultimately, so the states have been, uh, some of the states have said that they fought against this uh, tax haven phenomenon. For example, the European Union was creating like every year since 2005, I think, a blacklist of the tax havens. And actually, when you look at the last update of this blacklist of tax haven, what do you notice on it? There is no European Union country. So, of course, we can feel like we are going to fight tax havens, but especially the one that don't bother us, you know. So this is the point about like the hypocrisy you can have in terms of this legislation. So yes, now we want to broaden a bit this discussion and see policy implica implication and also uh, let's talk about the ideology between uh, like pre-tax uh, uh, policies or post-tax policies and how we can change in contribution due to, due to these taxes. So in the in, also in this book, uh, you you draw really good pictures of um, the fiscal history of uh, the U.S. and how uh, we we came from a very progressive tax to this. So basically, this is like here you have the different social classes from poor to rich, and uh, there's the different taxes in blue. It's a, it's not a public tax, but if you take into account only the white one, you can see that it's more or less like a flat tax and degressive for the rich people, obviously. And then uh, if you add the, the health insurance tax, which is counted as a tax in the book, because in a way everybody has to pay it, it's, it's even more degressive. Uh, so the idea is like, how, how do we, what was the story between this and before? Because for instance, there is a very, sort of very, very interesting uh, quotation in the book where you, you talk about uh, Hillary Clinton claiming that uh, uh, Trump never never paid taxes in his in his history, and this he and sir his answer was like that makes me smart. <laughs> and so how, how do we like when when you know a bit like the story of of US before, then we can have a, a politician talking like this. I mean, in a, in a way, it's very clever because he was just continuing the the the, the policies of Reagan, which which also uh, who also said which is is fine for him. I think whenever we lower the tax rates, our entire nation is better off. So yeah. What, what was the story behind this? Because perhaps everybody doesn't know this, this story. Uh, the US uh, in the last century was the most regressive, uh, progressive country in the world. Uh, so you can see here the top marginal income, income tax rate. So uh, during the, the war and until also here, you have rep Republican government there. The if Republican government here with the, the, the top marginal income rate that's like 80%, 90% is something which sounds crazy today. And yeah, the, the thing is like, how, how, how could you understand this, this shift and how to today we can even imagine, because this is like, if you have the total marginal income tax at 90%, it means that we have a, like a, a maximum wage in a way. Like we have a maximum wage, which is completely crazy, I think. And uh, to broaden the discussion, um, uh, you propose some policies in order to, to, to bridge this gap uh, between the past and today. First, using in, uh, policy inspired by, inspired by the, the past and also uh, other policies taking into account our, our global economy. 
So there's a lot of argument saying that, yes, it's ungraspable profits because uh, there's the international tax comp computation. How, how, could we, how could we make policy without being co coordinated? And we don't, we, it's, it's not possible to be coordinated. And you propose some policies which is nation driven in a way, which is, uh, which is really in interesting because it solves some issues. First, as you said, I'm just going to repeat uh, uh, briefly what you said before. So each country has to be the police of their multinational companies, so they have to track the profits the, the multinational company uh, are doing and uh, ask for, for, for them uh, the taxes. And also this, this very interesting idea of um, tax collector of last resort. And you, in the book, there is the example of Nestle. Because, for instance, you have, you have a, a company like, like Nestle where the headquarter is in Switzerland, where the tax rate is super low. How, how are you supposed to, to change this and, and get the profit? What, one, 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 one solution is to see how the sales, for instance, or how much profit have been done in France, and then say, OK, the, this is the share of the, the profit you've made in, share, in, in France. We're going to tax this, this share. Um, then, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, two quick questions uh, on what you presented, uh, just for us to close up. One thing, I think it's a, a bit of curiosity also. Uh, one thing that we noticed in the map you showed is that um, Asia, and especially East Asia, uh, presented a much lower uh, profit shifting. So less than 4% in China and Japan that are um, what, two of the biggest economies in the world. So what is that? And one of the first things that we think about is capital control. So if you could also uh, give us your opinion about capital controls and how they can be important for the profit shifting and what else could be behind um, the case of Asia. And also with well, also about your opinion about the pre-tax distribution conflict. We're always talking about taxation as the way of distribution. And here we, we bring a, a simple graph from the equitable growth, which correlates the, um, in the US, the union membership with the increase of share of income going to the top 10%. So how much of this normal uh, capital rise is something inherent to, the, to the capitalism or is also um, a result of uh, weakening labor rights and weakening labor organizations and unions and how that could be changed also in the future with uh, fortifying these organizations uh, or even going further for the debate of corporate ownership by workers, for example, uh, as done in, in the UK, for example. Yeah, this is our references. This is these are some uh, cool links you can check out to uh, replicate what they did in the paper and some of the databases they constructed that are very nice. That's it. That's all. Those are questions. And that some some further questions because we have a lot of questions. Uh, so, as an equality specialist, and given the complications of using aggregate production solo model. Why not use growth theories that relate inequality and growth through demand mechanisms? Don't you think inequality can affect growth rates? A second one, in your book, The Triumph and Injustice, you mentioned a tax on national income. Could you develop this idea and discuss how realistic is it? Uh, also, what policies could explain the lower profit shiftings in East Asia? What we just talked about, is it capital control? Is it other forms of income uh, taxing? What is playing a role there? So all your policy implications are about tax or tax oriented, uh, increasing taxes, even if even globally, but that may um, create some incentive to hide profits. Uh, so that's the issue with the uh, tax oriented policy. Instead, could we have more like a solution which fix the issue of income distribution and to avoid this constant struggle between capitalists and, and workers? Uh, do you, don't you think that first union, better union can, can help in order to, to have less inequality and also uh, a government governance based on workers' ownership, which is never discussed by Piketty, so, or at least like a participation, something like 50%, but never really talking about capitalists and, and workers, but even if it's one of the, the most important uh, reason of inequality. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, a really amazing discussion um, and, and great questions. So let, let me try to do my best to, uh, to answer those. So starting with the first one. So i like to start by saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to be uh, very modest in our ability to 
to quantify you know these issues of the tax avoidance uh tax uh, evasion uh which are inherently difficult to measure but also because just there's a great deal of opacity you know the the, the basic data that you would want to see published just are not published so for instance multinational companies today do not have to disclose publicly where they book their profits or how much tax they pay in each country where they operate they don't you know they just don't have to do that uh some companies in, in in specific sectors of the of the economy like banks have to do this you know in the european union since you know a directive of a few years ago but by and large multi you know there's just a, a great deal of opacity and so in that context we we need to use you know indirect methods we need to use imperfect data sources and we need to use macroeconomic data where we would like to use microeconomic data at the firm level and so it just you know introduces uh, some uncertainty and we need to make assumptions and the assumptions are never perfect and can always be challenged and so although we tried our best in that in this work on the missing profits of nations to 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 use the available data in in the most rigorous and, and comprehensive way possible the available data is just very limited and so you know I, I i i don't want to give the impression that this is the final word on the topic uh, or that we can quantify profit shifting with with a great deal of accuracy there are real uh, limitations okay and so the assumptions that we need to make are really far from from perfect and in the paper indeed the approach we took was to start from a, a you know a set of simple assumptions and then to say okay if we relax each assumption here is how the results change and try to construct bounds you know what's a lower bound for how much profits are shifted to tax havens globally what's an upper bound you know just give a sense and 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 the, the the uncertainty is real like the range of out of, of results you know for 2015 our main you know um estimated that there's about 600 billion dollars in profits shifted to tax havens globally and i think the lower bound is something like 400 billion and the upper bound is something like 800 billion you know it's 400 billion 800 billion it's it's, it's big but i cannot tell you if it's closer to 400 or 800 i think 600 is the best we can do with the data we have but again you know we, we have to be very modest and the point here is not only do we, ha we have to be modest but we need to ask and to fight for better data and for more transparency it shouldn't be okay for for multinational companies whose power sometimes rivals the power of of many states to be free to just disclose no information at all you know it shouldn't be possible um we need uh country by country reporting and not only country by country reporting we need public country by country reporting so any firm should be able to say this is how much profit we book in each country should be asked should be required to have the right to operate should be required to to say here's how much profits we report in each country here's how much tax we pay to each government if those data were public we wouldn't need to make all those assumptions. You know, we could just look at, oh, how much profits do you book in the Cayman Islands and to Ireland, and how many workers do you employ there, and you know, what's the value of your capital stock there, and so what what was the amount of excess profits that you book in low tax places relative to what could legitimately be explained by the uh, level of real like, economic activity that you have in those places, and so the computations could be much more accurate. We're not there yet, but I hope we will get there. And I, you know, to get there, we need real pressure from 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 civil society and not only from from uh, academics. Is there a question? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm happy to take questions now. Go, go, why don't you go ahead? Ah, so. Uh, 
so I can finish. Uh, okay, why don't I finish with that? So I do wait, and, and the substance of the first question, I do believe that uh, inequality affects growth rates. No, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's very simple to, to see. You know, imagine that uh, just one person in the world owned 99.9999% uh, of wealth, or even 100% of wealth you know, in the world. What would be the incentive for the rest of us to work or to, to, to do anything? Zero. So yes, it has to be the case that inequality and you know extreme inequality has to at some point depress growth rates now the question is what's the you know the empirical question is what's the level of inequality that's excessive in the sense that when you cross that threshold then actually growth starts to decline that's an empirical question it's a complicated question but to some extent what we're trying to do by collecting data for many countries and over time is to try to provide some empirical elements that can be used to, to answer that question of how much inequality is too much. But yeah, no, inequality does affect growth rates for sure. In the book, we mentioned a tax on national income. So what's a tax on national income? So it's a way to uh, re replace the VAT. You know, I started by saying you know, a lot of tax revenue come from VAT, flat tax rates on consumption, very regressive because the poor consume a higher fraction of their income than the rich. The super rich, you know, think billionaires, for them, the VAT is essentially trivial, essentially almost 0% of their income. So the VAT consumption taxes are really regressive. And in our view, they have no role to play you know, in an ideal tax system. In an ideal tax system, you don't have any tax on consumption. You don't have any VAT. You know, All of that could be... Uh, 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 abolished and replaced by one big income tax, whose uh, you know uh, one of its component being what we call a tax on national income. So think of that as a way to make the VAT. You know, it's a tax that will generate a lot of revenue, but in a much more progressive and fair manner than the VAT, because it would be not on consumption but on all of income, including you know the fraction of income that people save. Number three, what policies could explain lower profit shift in East Asia? I think the main reason is that, you know, if you take a, a, an economy like, like China's, um, uh, it's it just less open than, uh, you know, France or, or the US or higher income countries, meaning multinational companies in China account for a smaller fraction of total corporate profits and total corporate tax revenues. So th there are some you know, big Chinese multinational companies, but you know, they are not very big relative to the size of the domestic you know, Chinese corporate sector that's just you know, very, very big. And so even though these multinationals do shift some profits or foreign multinationals that operate in China, you know, the implied profit losses and corporate income taxes uh, that are lost are a bit smaller than in, in countries that are more, that are more uh, open. And for Japan, it's actually pretty much the same, you know, I think the same story, less extreme than China, but, uh, but, uh, but that's, the same, that's the same story. In very, very big countries, generally speaking, you know, the bigger the country is, the, the smaller the fraction, the less internationalized it's going to be, right? So for very small countries, you know, multinational companies are going to be, you know, expand a big fraction of corporate profits. And for very big, very big companies, you know, China, Japan, the US to some extent also has a bit less, you know, profit losses than countries like individual EU member states in our estimates are the countries that have the higher losses of profits and tax revenues. Uh, Pre-distribution, that's a very interesting question. So yes, um, uh, fundamentally there are, there are two ways to regulate inequality. You can try to reduce the concentration of of, of market income, of pre-tax and transfer income, what's called sometimes pre-distribution policies. Thing by you know things like education policies are going to affect the pre you know tax and pre-transfer distribution of income. Uh, unions, of course, are very important determinant of pre-tax and transfer income distributions. And then you have you know uh, redistribution policies, taxes and, and transfers and. What I want to say is that both are very important. Both sets of policies are very important to regulate inequality. And 
possibly you no know, pre-tax distribution can be even more important than, than uh, tax, taxes and, and transfers. If you look at the countries that have the lowest level of inequality or that have managed to reduce inequality more than other countries, if you think of Scandinavian countries, for instance, or if you think of you know, what, what, what the situation in the post-World War II decades in, the, in, in, uh, in, in continental Europe, it was through a mix of pre-distribution and tax and transfer policies that those countries manage or, or manage to, to reduce inequality. So both are very important. I will just end by saying that, you know, the frontier, let's say the, the, the frontier between redistribution and redistribution policies is not super clear. One illustration of that, taxation, you know, oftentimes people think of taxation as a redistribution policy, right? But the tax system is also a pre-distribution policy. Think about the U.S. policy that you discussed, you know, in the middle of 20th century of very, very high uh, top marginal income tax rates and very high earners. And in 1942, Franklin Roosevelt, the president of the U.S., goes to Congress and he says, look, I think that no American should have an income after paying taxes of more than $25,000 of the time, which is about a million dollars of today. Therefore, I propose to introduce a 100% top marginal income tax rate above $25,000 on all sources of income, 100%. So essentially, exactly as was said, a maximum income policy. No one, and he says exactly like that, no one should have more than $25,000 after taxes. Okay, and so members of Congress are still like, 100%, mm, you know, maybe it's a bit too much, that's really a lot, but uh, they, at the end of the day, agree on 94%, you know, top marginal income tax rate on 94%, which is not very far from 100%. So a quasi-maximum income policy. And this, it's, it's, it's a tax policy, but it affects the pre-tax. That's really the important thing to understand. It affects the pre-tax distribution of income. Because when you have a 100% or almost 100% tax rate above a certain level, there's just no incentive anymore to earn income above that level. You know, if any income above 1 million is going to be taxed at 100% or even 90%, well, wh why am I going to spend time trying to earn more than a million? It's just pointless. And so people are going to stop doing that. And that's exactly what happened, you know, in the US, you know, after this, at the time of this policy, you see that essentially very, very few people start reporting super high incomes because you know it's just, it's just it, there's no, just, just no incentive anymore to do that. And so tax policy affects the, affects the pre-tax distribution is also a, a pre-distribution policy. Okay, that's it for now. All right, so. Okay. My my question uh, has to do with um, the tax collector of last resort, that concept, um, because it's across international water. It could be like, let's just use an international company, um, like a GAFAM one like this, right? Um, so I guess like with the Laffer curve, it would be, it could be, or I don't know if you could clarify if it is sectoral specific um, um, and, and related to state objectives because in uh, i'm just thinking in terms on a uh, of a global scale if you use this tax collector resort um and then uh, make it the laffer curve um, determine the tax rate based on industry and objectives saying you know we want to fix climate change or or um try to compensate um destination countries for um, for impact of these multinationals, is this a possibility? I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> or is this uh, being explored? Something like that. Okay, would you like two or three questions? I can... Okay, I go that way first and then, but not too many questions. Huh? Mm -hmm. okay. Merci. Uh... Hello. Okay, okay so, Hello, thank you, Professor, for the great presentation. Um, I have been following your work for the last few years, and I have I am very impressed by many of your papers, and specifically by the way you share data, so that it allows others to also 
rep replicate the tables and w work on it. So I really appreciate that specific aspect. I, I I saw that in your presentation, you talked about developing countries in, in, in the last, but I am writing my thesis on financial flows. And what I, what I came to understand is that the role our global monetary system and the role financial flows play, they enable this tax evasion. So the role of developing country is, is not a secondary one, but is a primary one. Because also we see that the explosion of tax evasion and wealth inequality came after, after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. And so the nature, it, it was also in after Bretton Woods, that's the nature of the global financial system changed and morphed into this deregulated system where tax evasion is really easy. So I just want to hear your thought about the interplay between financial flows on, on the one hand and tax evasion, and also the effect of that on underdevelopment and climate change, for example. Um, I just want to comment on, just a comment on Joao's question about Asia, because we see that uh, we see that the capital controls in Asia are very specific in the sense that the financial system is constrained by. But nevertheless, there are large financial flows from Asia to the U.S. So Asia has a commercial surplus, but a financial deficit, whereas the U.S. has a financial surplus and a commercial deficit. So that relationship, I think, it's really crucial to understand there. Um, and finally, uh, it's just like about morality and Trump saying that he was smart by not paying taxes. Um, yesterday, while preparing for the for the presentation here, I read in the Financial Times that European banks are really struggling to to leave Russia and that they don't want to stay, so that they don't pay taxes to finance the war. Um, so, I mean, your war could also be used by the United States to to earn more taxes and the United States then could wage a war. It will, certainly in the future. So what do you think about your work being used by the United States, for example, to raise more taxes and then finance its own wars in the future? Thank you. And we take others then. Yeah, thanks a lot for great questions. Um, so on the, on the notion of a tax collector of last resort, so every time I have the opportunity to 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 talk about those ideas, you know, in a, in a different country, I try to convince people from that country that they could be the one, you know, starting this process. Any country could play this role of, of you know tax collector of last resort. So I want to make sure that everybody understands this notion because it's actually quite quite critical. Tax collector of last resort means you know you have to start from the notion of a, a tax deficit. You know so what's a tax deficit? A tax deficit is um, the difference between what a, a company pays in taxes today and what it would have to pay if in each country where it, it makes profits, it was subject to a, a certain minimum tax rate, let's say of 25%. You know, 25% is typically what small and medium-sized companies pay, is the statutory tax rate in a country like France. Many countries have tax rates around that level. And so it makes sense to say, okay, multinational companies, the big winners from globalization, you know, very powerful economic actors, they should at least pay that. 25% on a country by country basis. So for each company, you can compute this, you know, uh, how much they would pay if they were subject to a 25% tax on a country by country basis. And then you can compute the difference between that and what they actually pay, which is typically much less. And the result of that difference is the tax deficit. So for any company, Apple, you know, BMW, what have you, every, every company, you, you can compute the tax deficit. And then, some countries have to collect those deficits. Which countries? Well, you know, the simplest way to proceed would be to say, to, 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 you know, different, many ways to do that. You know, it could be, you know, based on population, for instance. If a country has a big population, then presumably it, you know, 
uh, has lots of customers also. And so we, the tax deficit could be apportioned based on population. It could be apportioned based on lots of things. One simple way to proceed would be to say when we're going to divide the tax deficit based on, on sales or based on where the customers of the companies are located, you know, where these multinational companies make their sales. And so then you take any country in the world and you say, well, let's say, I don't know, we're in France. So we can take France to say, you know, France, let's take Apple. Apple has a tax deficit, let's say, of 10 billion euros makes 10% of its sales in France. And so France could say, okay, if you want to have access to our market, you have to you know, abide by a certain number of, of laws and regulation, which is already the case today. There are all sorts of, of you know, uh, norms that you have to respect to be able to access a market, you know, environmental you know, uh, norms and others. And so we could just add an extra norm, which would be, well, you have to, you know, if you have a tax deficit, you, you have to uh, pay some of that tax deficit back to us. So in my example, if you have 10 billion euros in tax deficit, you make 10% of your sales in France, then you would have to pay 10% times 10 billion, which is 1 billion in taxes in France. And what I want to emphasize that, you know, all the information to, uh, implement this already exists today because although there is no public country by country data multinational companies have to disclose privately to the tax authorities of each country their accounts on a country by country basis which means that the tax authority of each country today uh, or most countries at least has access to the country by country accounts of apple let's say and so tax authorities of most countries, they can compute the tax deficit of Apple and they can say, okay, here's the fraction of your sales that you make in our country. And so they can say, well, okay, here's how much you have to pay if you want to keep accessing our market. So the idea is that, you know, the broader, bigger picture idea is that um, there has to be counterparts to, um, uh, you know, uh, free trade, free movements of capital. There has to be, you know, uh, 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 duties and not only rights for multinational companies in international agreements. In the types of agreements that we've signed, you know, since the 1980s, there are only essentially rights. There's a right to access all the world's markets with minimal trade barriers, with minimal tariffs, with uh, uh, maximum guarantees in terms of property rights and so on. But there needs to be more duties. And the basic duty is the duty to pay a certain minimum amount of tax. And the way to, to get there is, I think, the powerful way to get there is by, by moving towards this you know, collection of the tax deficit in a decentralized manner. Because what's possible with this framework is you don't need a global, you don't need a, a, a global agreement, you don't need unanimity. Any country that has a political will to do that can say, we're stepping ahead and we're going to start to collect our share of the tax deficit of multinational companies. Okay, so that's that's really the, the idea, if it makes any sense at all. Uh, to answer your question, um, um, uh, so on, on, uh, on developing countries, yes, I very much agree that um, uh, and we try to quantify that in, in our work, you know, in particular in the missing profits of nations, that you know, there are sizable uh, losses of, of uh, tax revenues for developing countries that are caused by you know, tax avoidance and tax evasion by uh, foreign multinational companies that operate in those countries or domestic multinational companies. Um, and and, um, and uh, the fundamental issue the, the, that I've try, tried to stress in the presentation is that uh, these uh, uh, countries at the moment have too little say in the crafting of potential solutions to those problems. You know, a lot of the discussions take place at the at the OECD, where you know developing countries essentially are not represented. And so, it's very important in the future to move towards much more inclusive international institutions. We need essentially, you know, a new type of international organization that would. Uh, 
be truly global and that would take really, really seriously the interests of, of developing countries when it comes to distributing tax revenues, when it comes to regulating, you know, multinational corporations, when it comes to regulating inequality more broadly, because we need to tax not only multinationals, but also, you know, global billionaires, you know, very high income individuals. And, and the, the most logical and powerful way to do that is to do it in a coordinated manner. And right now, this institution that, that, that would, uh, 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 you know, take the interest of developing countries seriously doesn't exist, and I hope it will it will soon uh, uh, exist because it's really critical. Um, um, yeah, so I hope that addresses you know uh, your question. Um, thank you. I would have a question to the public country by country reporting. Um, I was kind of with the parliament when the, direct, the latest directory was discussed and now um, yeah, the commission I think took it. Um, and you really rely on that data and that also then countries individually kind of like contribute to it. But why would the countries contribute it if they on an EU level are not really all willing to go for really, I don't know, low levels of tax reporting with like multinational uh, companies. It all kind of, Following the discussions, it all seems like, why should we be the ones? So where's the incentive for the country to report it? Because then they could actually fear again that if they're the only country, the company just leaves, if people believe that. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the um, digital nomads and um, like, uh, tax uh, policies, like favorable, favorable tax policies for uh, freelancers and digital nomads in some countries. What is your opinion on this? And do you think that uh, these countries could uh, feel potential downsides of such a policy? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a similar question about the, I have two questions about the digital taxation. Um, first is that uh, um, recently the, uh, more countries are starting to uh, consider uh, the revolution of the digital taxation about the monopoly of those uh, big tech companies. Um, for instance, to increase the threshold of the tax for those um, big techs. And on the one hand, it can um, help to solve the problems of uh, inequality. But on the other side, it can um, hidden the um, development of um, digital economics. So um, would you think that is there is something special to consider for the digital taxation? And uh, related to the part, the second question is about that. We know that digital taxation is first launched and implement, implemented in OECD and the Western countries, um, for instance, to uh, uh, design the minimum and taxation standards. But uh, for developing countries, it's still a lack of um, practice used to uh, to uh, launch the taxation. For instance, in China, um, the digital uh, economy accounted for more than 30% of the uh, national GDP. And in Vietnam, um, Vietnam and the Thailand, those countries, the digital taxation is really hard to uh, launch. So I would, ask, I would like to ask, uh, uh, is there any implications from the developing, developed countries to developing countries? Thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for being here in the presentation. I have like two different questions. Uh, one is more technical and it's about, so when you were commenting and saying that uh, pushing for every country to start the tax collector of last resort policy, um, wouldn't it be the case that it cannot work for countries in which the demand for the multinational products and services is small? Because in that case, the firm would just leave the country uh, and therefore not really uh, caring about how taxation works in that particular country. Um, we're talking about multinationals whose power is larger than the one on the country they're operating. And then the other question uh, is somehow, um, somehow no, it is related to what uh, my classmates brought up in their discussion about how this all started with Reaganomics and uh, this huge tax uh, cut in the US. Um, and the empowerment of the rich of the super top top billionaires. And how has that through decades given them more and more power? They put TV channels and radio stations from all over the country. They set up a new way of uh, a new ways of um, 
reproducing their power, not only economically, but also uh, mediatically and then also politically. So how does this tax solution, uh, which is very technical dialogues with the real economy and, and the political economy? Okay. Well, okay, very, very good questions. Um... Where to start? Uh, let me start with the, with the last question. Uh, uh, yes, taxation is a very you know can be a very technical issue, and at the same time, we need to talk much more about taxation. And you know the reason why I spend so much time uh, working studying this is I. Um, I think you know it's it's difficult to envision you know uh, 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 progress towards uh, reducing inequality, uh, uh, you know dealing with uh, uh, climate change and and addressing the the big picture challenges of of the day without some some pretty you know dramatic changes in taxation. What's the basic reason for that? It's because you know we live in countries where um, the the government collects 30 40 50 percent of of all income in taxes right here in france that the ratio of taxes to to national income is more like 55 percent uh in most eu countries it's you know between 45 and 55 percent even in the us which is a relatively low tax state among high income countries it's 30% of national income so it's just it's it's just very big right it's just every year you have to realize that every year the government you know here in france takes more than half of all income and redistributes more than half of all income that's been generated during during the year and and so the way that that this works you know, with what level of progressivity, uh, in particular, is just is just critical. It's just a very very first order way that that we organize uh, society and 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 collective action, and and um, uh, there's been a lack of attention to taxation among you know progressive movements, social movements. Uh, the different political and, and and civil society movements that want to that fight for you know a more equal world in in i, I think you know there's been a lack of uh, attention and, and care for these tax issues and and um i think it's very important to kind of explain concretely how actual progress can be made so that potential solutions are more broadly discussed uh, in the in the media, in the public debate, in Parliament, you know, among citizens, and that's how you can you can have progress. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's my that's my view. If you look at you know what happened in the U.S., the you know certainly uh, Reagan people around Reagan they talked a lot about taxation, a lot. They really they, they spend that time you know explaining how the Laffer curve, you know, you cut taxes and revenues increase. Or how the inheritance tax is a death tax, or that you know that, and and they keep hammering this, and and they've been very successful at creating a whole social movement around around you know taxation, but a very negative view of of taxation and collective action, and there's absolutely not been the equivalent of that you know nearly uh, close to that on on the other side of the political spectrum, and so you have a big imbalance. That I think is really critical to address if you want to improve, you know, public policies and get, you know, obtain more equality. So, question on digital uh, taxation. Um, my view about this is that, generally speaking, the the, the tax policies that work the best uh, are, are comprehensive in the sense that they apply ideally to all sectors of the economy. And um, there's been a lot of talk uh, in recent years about, you know, introducing digital taxes, de dealing with the digital sector specifically. It was a big project, for instance, of France that was pushed by the French government, you know, at the EU level uh, to have a, a tax specific on the digital sector, and it failed. Um, uh, and and I think it was it was 
you know, to some extent, it, it's not the right way to approach things. So to pretty differently, profit shifting, corporate tax avoidance, uh, is a widespread phenomenon. It's an across the board phenomenon. It's not only the tech companies that do it. It's true that some of the you know uh, big offenders are in the tech sector, and it's true that the tech sector has been growing very fast, and that some of the top you know multinational companies in China, in the U.S. at the world level, are in the digital economy, and so they account for a lot of tax revenue and a lot of of, of you know corporate tax avoidance. But you know companies in the pharmaceutical sector in the financial sector, in the manufacturing sector, you know, across the board, use the same techniques to shift profits to the very same places. They are advised by the same uh, consulting firms, you know, tax advisory firms, they just do the same thing. And so, you know, it's the same problem everywhere. And so you need comprehensive solution. And uh, so I think that's that's really the way, the way forward. Um, question on uh, digital nomad, nomads. Um, it's a very good question. It's an illustration of, you know, the emerging um, uh, forces, the em emerging forms of tax competition that uh, that we see burgeoning today. So I, I spent a lot of time, perhaps too much in the presentation, talking about, uh, you know, tax havens or you know, countries like Ireland and so on. Uh, benefiting a lot from from uh, tax competition, from slashing taxes on certain tax bases, and attracting a lot of you know ac activity or profits and deriving revenue from that. The truth is that these forces of tax competition they they apply universally. That is, all countries have been subject to the same forces and have been tempted to become tax havens of sorts. You know, offering low tax rates to certain economic actors could be freelancers, could be you know. Uh, uh, multinational companies could be high-income individuals, could be retirees. Uh, so you see, you know, schemes like that that emerge everywhere around the world. Like even, you know, in in countries that are much bigger and in size than traditional tax havens, uh, they offer special deals to certain categories of the population, certain tax deals, and uh, it just illustrates the fact that we. Um, uh, uh, we need more. We need urgently to to uh, to evolve towards more cooperation and more coordination, because the problem with tax competition is that it's a very uh, negative form of, in, of 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 international competition. Okay, it uh, typically uh, is good for uh, the act, the economic actors who most benefit from. Uh, the current economic trends from globalization, from the rise of inequality, who has most benefited from tax competition? So far, it's been multinational companies, high-income individuals, wealthy individuals, and so on. So it's a very negative form of international competition. There will always be international competition, but we need to transition to more positive forms of competition where countries would compete by you know, offering the best education, having the best uh, universities, you know, having the best public infrastructure, having uh, you know, uh, 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 workers who have a high purchasing power to buy goods, you know, very, very uh, a uh, rich, um, uh, uh, you know, market and things like that, and and if we want to get there, we we need to put floors, high floors to tax competition, and so it's a uh, it's a very serious issue. Um, the last, the first question was about public uh, uh, CBCR country by country uh, reporting, and uh, the fear that some countries have, where they say, well, we cannot be the only country to mandate. Uh, public country by country reporting because um, uh, you know it's uh, firms are going to dislike it and they will choose to uh, stop operating in our country and it's going to create a, a, an imbalanced uh, playing field between our corporations that would be subject to public country by country reporting and other corporations. It also relates to a question that was that was asked and I forgot to answer, which is. Wouldn't it be the case that if a country unilaterally played the role of tax collector of last resort, then multinationals would simply choose to stop operating in that country? So these these are linked. And let me address those two questions. So on uh, public country by country reporting, I just don't understand the argument of multinational companies that say that somehow it reveals deep secrets about their operations. You know, the, we are talking about just very basic financial information on how much profits they make in each country, 
how much tax they pay in each country, how much employees they have. What, you know, what valuable secret is, is there? It's just bullshit. You know, it's, it's just meaningless to say that somehow having to disclose that is going to put any company at, uh, at, at uh, you know, it's going to be unfair to that company relative to another company that wouldn't have the same type of obligation. We know it's total bullshit because many companies in the financial sector, but also in, in extractive industries uh, or already have to publicly disclose their country by country reports and have been for banks have been doing that since 2014 in the EU. So it's been eight, you know, more than eight years. You know, has it destroyed the competitiveness of the European banking sector relative to the US banking sector? No, I mean, so it's really very basic information that companies have to disclose. There's just no good reason for not making that information public. It's just meaningless. Uh, what would happen if a, a, a country like uh, any, you know, a country unilaterally starts to play the role of tax collector of last resort? So France tomorrow says, okay, let's go. Let's do it. We're going to collect the taxes that are not collected by tax havens. And we're going to ask Apple to pay more. And we're going to ask, you know, all the multinationals that have a tax deficit to pay more. And well, I think it's, I think, well, we have to see, I think it will work. It will work for the following reason. There are two cases. Case number one is that you know the multinationals have do not have a lot of clients in France, do not make a lot of sales in France. France is not an important market for them. In that case, by definition, France would collect very little tax because the tax is based on how big the sales are in France. So if France is a small market for Apple, Apple is going to pay very little in France. And so they don't care. You know, they're just going to have to pay a bit more. Okay, all the time they have to pay a bit more here and there. And you know. if France is a big market for Apple, then they're going to have to pay a lot more in taxes. But it's a big market. So they have no reason to say, oh, now we are, we are you know, uh, closing, shutting down. We don't serve, don't want to serve that big market anymore. It's not in their interest because the taxes that they would have to pay, even if they are big, they would be still quite small compared to the revenues that they make in France because it's a big market, right? So I think it would work for that reason. Uh, let me add that it's, it's always better to have multilateral action than purely unilateral action. So what would be most powerful is if you had, let's say, uh, Spain, uh, Germany, uh, France, together, they account for, I think, something like 40% of EU GDP or 30, 30, 40% of EU GDP. So take those three countries, jointly saying we are going, it's just three countries, shouldn't be so complicated, jointly saying we are going to uh, apply this system of tax collector of last resort. 30, 40% of the EU market, the EU market is really big, you know, no serious multinational company can just say we're not going to operate in the EU. So that's perhaps the most powerful uh, approach. That's a very important question. There is, yeah. We have there one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three. Okay, last three. Hi, thank you for your presentation and also to the discussants. I have many questions, but maybe um, do you, there seems to be many times a, not a, or a detachment between fiscal and taxing policy and let's say financial or, or regulation or yeah, a regulatory framework. And in this sense, uh, there has been a lot of um, controversy between big tech companies and the U.S. and their the discussion between if they should be dismantled or not and uh, if they are competing in fair terms or not. Uh, do you think these kind of policies, if they come around and if they if it happens, they are dismantled, could contribute to increase tax evasion? Uh, or yeah, tax evasion or or tax illusion, because the rationale of that would be okay. You you have uh, smaller companies, so it might be easier to maneuver through or to like uh, shift profits or to do any kind of um, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, th uh, thank you. It was very interesting. I was wondering about solutions and uh, maybe what would you think would be the, the realistic concrete steps that could be done uh, in order to like do these three big things, which is like um, beyond the two police agreement and more like cooperation and more direct actions and uh, so on. And um, I'm asking that because um, you were talking about this decentralized system um, of uh, collecting uh, the profits. If a country doesn't do it, then uh, another country you could do that. And I think from my perspective, I don't, uh, I don't know if I understood it like completely, but uh, it seems very unrealistic in a sense of uh, implementation because uh, those countries that it would impact most, it would never join such a like ev even like multilateral agreement. So without uh, probably yeah, some international pressure. So yeah, I'm, I'm asking about the solutions uh, and uh, like maybe the steps for uh, the solutions to implement like these three, um, uh, yeah, three perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great uh, questions. Uh, on, the, on the link between firm size and, and tax avoidance, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's ambiguous, you know, whether when you have bigger companies, they shift more profits or they shift less profit or evade less in taxes. So when, when you're bigger, you know, it's easier to, to uh, uh, you know, typically you have more subsidiaries all over the world. And so it's easier to move profits around and to benefit from lower rates, you know, here and there. And so from that perspective, bigger firms might be, you know, more likely to actually shift profits to low tax places. But at the same time, you know, bigger companies, especially if they are listed in, in the stock market and they, you know, they attract more scrutiny, they have to disclose a bit more public information, smaller private businesses, meaning not listed, there might be more tax, tax evasion going on there because they have less kind of auditing requirements. So it could go in any direction, I would, I would say. You know, I think these two issues to a large extent are, are orthogonal. I think uh, it's important to uh, 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 more, have more forceful uh, antitrust and to have more competition. And uh, you know, generally speaking, it's probably a good thing for the economy. At the same time, it's not going to solve all, all the problems. You know, sometimes people, you know, have the view that you know, if only we had more perfect markets, more competition, uh, more entry, and and then everything would be great. You know, like in in, in textbook economics, uh, like in economics textbooks, right? Where, uh, like in Mencius textbook, yes. If only we got closer to the assumptions of the first welfare theorem, where everybody is rational and there's perfect information, and there's perfect competition, and no economic actor has any market power, then it's like uh, heaven on earth. You know, nothing could be, could be better because you know, the, everything is efficient. I think it, it's too simplistic. So there's efficiency and I, antitrust is, is you know, necessary to get more efficiency, but there's also equity, uh, tax equity, but also you know, a fair distribution of uh, income and wealth. And you're not going to achieve that with antitrust. So you need those two types of, of policies. Um, the other question on, uh, sorry, I'm blanking. Uh, yes, on the, the, whether the solutions are realistic uh, or not. Um, yes, they are. Why? Because, you know, look, look at the past, you know, look at history. Uh, uh, and let, you know, look at what happened for, for bank secrecy, where people said, the same, you know, they had the same type of arguments as yours. When there was complete bank secrecy in, in Switzerland, in similar offshore financial centers, they said, it's impossible to change. You know, any country on its own is not going to be able to convince S Switzerland to abolish their, their bank secrecy, their, that's their choice. And, you know, it benefits them. It attracts a lot of activity, it attracts wealth, that generates income and fees for the bankers. 
it's not in their interest to do things differently, and so we are stuck. However, things changed. They changed because, uh, you know, in that case, the U.S., but it could have been Germany and France, you know, that who actually lost much more, you know, tax revenues because of offshore tax evasion in Switzerland. They, Germany, France could have played and should have played that role, but because the U.S. said, look, if you don't cooperate, you will you will face, you know, very concrete uh, economic sanctions, you know, uh, very concrete taxes on all payments, you know, going from the U.S. to Switzerland and so on and so on. They were very precise about that. And on that threat, th there was, there was, you know, real change that happened. And so here, the, the analogy, the analogy that I'm trying to draw is, is the tax collector of last resort policy is the same thing is either you increase, it's essentially what it, what it amounts to is telling tax havens, either you increase your tax rates or you can keep them low, but we will collect taxes on your behalf. And if we do collect taxes on your behalf, look what's going to happen. If a multinational company keeps booking profits in Bermuda, but you know, France collects you know, the taxes that Bermuda doesn't collect, you know, what, it, what's the point for Bermuda to have a low tax rate? It's going to undermine their uh, uh, economic uh, model. And let me end with that you know, important point, which is that, and it's also a way, but perhaps a better answer to the question that was raised on digital nomads. The fundamental uh, problem with tax competition, well, one fundamental problem is that it's an inherently uh, unstable uh, and risky and uh, uh, um, uh, flawed uh, development model. Meaning you, know, you have a number of countries that have you know, chosen to play the card of tax competition particularly aggressively. And again, I'm stressing that all countries have been tempted to do that to some extent you know, because of globalization. But the notion that you can you know, get rich and develop and grow by offering lower tax rates than your neighbors, it doesn't work in the long run. It works as long as other countries tolerate tax competition. But tax competition, you know, countries can tolerate it. Sometimes they can encourage it, but they can also refuse it. And they can also say, no, we're not going to play the, the tax competition game anymore. And so it's, it's, it's flawed, you know, to base your development model on tax competition. As soon as other countries, the largest countries, especially where the customers are located, say, we don't accept those rules anymore, and we are going to collect the taxes that other countries choose not to collect, and it's game over for the, you know, it, it undermines the development model of countries that have, you know, believed that they could grow by offering very low tax rates. It can work in the, long, in the short run, but I, fundamentally, I think that in the long run, it's, it's bound to fail.